Welcome to the Greg Lancaster Show. Today, my, my guest is going to be Pat Hamilton and Steve Kalaszewski. We're talking about super chickens. That's right, super chickens, super church. What does God expect from us as the church? Is it as hard as religions made it out to be? We're going to talk about some intricate studies and things that we learned. It's going to be funny. We're going to learn some wisdom. But one thing we're going to learn is it's not as complicated as 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 religions have made it out to be, to be the church. You're going to be encouraged. You're going to be inspired. And hang in there. We're so glad that you join us right after this intro. We're going to be right on. Welcome, welcome. Hey, Pat, how you doing, man? Hey, hey, what's going on? <laughs> so pretty good. How, how are you, Steve? What's that happening? Good oh, to see you. I'm good to see you. Oh, man, I'm telling you what. We're not going <laughs> to talk about the hair color. So is that real? Is the hair color real? Is it real? <laughs> it's only as real as the as long as I choose the right color on the box. How come Pat and I are the only ones getting gray here? I, mean, I don't know what's up. What's <laughs> yeah, up with right. that? You know what I'm, I'm saying? I don't really know. No, I'm just kidding. It's authentic. Lee, it what is. was in the box? Or is this like real stuff? They were I'm not. I, I, actually grew, I actually grew it myself. You what? still frosting them? Are you defrosting no. them? <laughs> <laughs> Can you defrost blood. your hair? <laughs> is, is it you defrost your hair? Is that what you do? Uh, no. That would be a pet question. You know, if he, if he wasn't a Marine, we wouldn't do this. But he is a Marine, so he can take anything. Listen, That's we're right. so That's glad right. you joined us today on the Greg Lancaster Show, live from the glory zone. Mm. And uh, we're going to be talking about Believe it or not, super chickens, super chickens. It's actually a study that was done about super chickens. You know, we got, we're, we're in a, we're literally in a society that says, can you supersize that for me? I like a super, as a matter of fact, I think they had a movie. Did they have a movie called Super Size Me or something like that? Mm -hmm. Wow. That was deep. Do you hear anything else about that? <laughs> <laughs> can you stress that? Is it, was it like, uh, did it have pictures and video in it or what do you think? No, there was a guy that actually did a like grassroots documentary all about like the fast food industry, and he ate nothing but McDonald's food for thirty days. He had to be healthy, right? Oh yeah, I've heard of that one. It's actually a really good informational movie if you haven't seen it. I've actually seen that one, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> you seen that one? No, just the consequences from eating at that menu. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I quit eating in places a long time ago. I was so yeah. confused. You pull up, and you you're going to order a hamburger, and they go, "Do you want to supersize that?" I was like. I'm confused. What does that mean? I mean, it's already bad. <laughs> you want to make a super size for the thing? And so, but you know, we're just in that mindset, aren't we? That it, yeah. well, the world is, America is. It's like when I went to Israel, when I went to Israel, uh, there was so many shocks. But the biggest shock was when I went to the store and they had little bitty containers for their food. I mean, we got big tubs of butter here, we got big tubs of everything. They had just little, little small containers of food. And I'm like, oh, Maybe it's not right what we're doing in America. Right? <laughs> and then I, you know, went shopping with Donna, my wife, and uh, sometime back, back in the anyway. So, and I went to Sam's with her, and it's like shelves of just huge stuff. It's like, yeah, I would like not just one large box of detergent, but thirty boxes of detergents. Like know? warehouses, shelves, or warehouses. Yeah. That's how blessed we are. We're just. So, I looked at that and said, "Thank God, look at this blessing that we have here." Right, and so. But you know, that tra that's actually translated down to the church where the people aren't happy or think it's church unless it's what? Supersized. You know, super. It's like, I know this is good, but can we have some acoustics with that and a little, you know, a little bit less of that? And we need some, can we give it a million dollar soundboard here? And by the way, he needs to do something with his hair. He needs to spike up more like Steve's hair. You know what I'm saying? He needs to be a little spiky, a little design, that type of thing. Well, there's a study done and uh, about literally discovering about corporations and we can learn so much about you know how we do things by just looking at how things are you know romans chapter 1 verse 20 says you know that we can understand god by the things that he's designed and you can uh, this particular study done by margaret uh hefferman uh she was doing a ted talk with ted women in 2015 and she's talking about you know what makes corporations successful you know what makes companies successful everybody's interested in that and i would hope the church is you know interested in that and i'm thinking about you know i'm thinking about you know what you know what jesus said and before we enter into what she talks about it's very important I mean, this, think about this they study chickens and and don't go away because we're going to tell you the secret 
to be a successful chicken, right? To be a successful super, not, not a super, I don't know. It's a secret and we're going to share it in just a moment, but I want you to hold on, I want you to listen or watch what, you know, Jesus said about it in his word. He's talking about, you know, specifically about how can we, in a, a successful chicken is measured by this. How many eggs did you lay? How fruitful were you, right? That's, that's a successful chicken. Well, look at this. Jesus tells us right here in the scriptures. He says, he says, he didn't say that. This is what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see what he said right here. There we go. There we go. This is what he said. There he is. Okay, we got her up. Okay. He said, uh, Jesus says, this is him saying this. So this is his words. This is red letter, but they're not red letter. He says, I am the vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, but every branch that bears fruit, in other words, every chicken that lays eggs, uh, he prunes that it may be more fruitful. You are, <laughs> look at this, you are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branches cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in the vine. Look, look it says a little bit further down, he says, he says, I am the vine. So Jesus is saying, I gave you an analogy here, but he's going, you know, I am, I am the vine. So that's what he's talking about. I am the vine. You are the branches. He abides in me. He who abides in me, I in him will bear much fruit. For without me, he can do nothing. So we can't lay no eggs. If we're a chicken, we can't lay any eggs without Jesus touching us and us walking with Jesus. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out and thrown and to be withered and gathered in the fire. Oh my goodness, go to verse seven. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. By this, by being fruitful, by laying more eggs in the analogy, he says, you'll be glorifying the Father. This is how we glorify the Father, by, by, by being fruitful, that we may bear much fruit. Look at verse 16, he says, you didn't even choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and the fruit that remains, lasting fruit. And this is to our Father's glory that you do this. So you're looking at it. It's just so powerful to watch, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, what, you know, we're not even looking into It's like, how do we be more fruitful? And we kind of look a lot like the super chicken when you think about it. You know, we're actually thinking that, you know, you know we should, <laughs> you know, pay somebody to do the work, right? Well, here she is. This is this right here is um let me get her name for you so i get it right for you this is um margaret hefner she's speaking at the women's conference at a woman's summit and ted talk ted talk women and she's talking about a study that was done for a super chicken check it out we'll be right back after she's talking about this to talk about how does that apply to us if we're looking at the super chicken super size me type menu an evolutionary biologist at Purdue University named William Muir studied chickens. He was interested in productivity. I think it's something that concerns all of us. But it's easy to measure in chickens because you just count the eggs. <laughs> he wanted to know what could make his chickens more productive, so he devised a beautiful experiment. Chickens live in groups, so first of all, he selected just an average flock, and he let it alone for six generations. But then he created a second group of the individually most productive chickens. You could call them super chickens. And he put them together in a super flock. And each generation, he selected only the most productive for breeding. After six generations had passed, what did he find? Well, the first group, the average group, was doing just fine. They were all plump and fully feathered, and egg production had increased dramatically. What about the second group? Well, all but three were dead. They'd pecked the rest to death. The individually productive chickens had only achieved their success by suppressing the productivity of the rest. Now, as I've gone around the world talking about this and telling this story in all sorts of organizations and companies, people have seen the relevance almost instantly, and they come up and they say things to me like, that super flock, that's my company. <laughs> or, that's my country. 
well, that's my life. All my life, I've been told that the way we have to get ahead is to compete, get into the right school, get into the right job, get to the top. And I've really never found it very inspiring. I've started and run businesses because invention is a joy, and because working alongside brilliant, creative people is its own reward. And I've never really felt very motivated by pecking orders or by super chickens, or by superstars. But for the past 50 years, we've run most organizations and some societies along the super chicken model. We've thought that success is achieved by picking the superstars, the brightest men or occasionally women in the room, and giving them all the resources and all the power. And the result has been just the same as in William Muir's experiment: aggression, dysfunction, and waste. If the only way the most productive can be successful is by suppressing the productivity of the rest, then we badly need to find a better way to work and a richer way to live. This is so powerful. This is so powerful. You're seeing this study they did about super chickens. Obviously, this is not about chickens. This is about how to be more productive. And today, when you think about it, how many people just end up paying someone to be the superstar? You know, you go out and you, you know, in the church, you know, you're going to be the van. As a matter of fact, a lot of people volunteer to be the superstar. There's people like I want my name up in lights, and this is what I want. So, I mean, we could learn a lot because the interest, the interesting thing was the ones that were more productive what, weren't the superstars. I mean, think about that, Steve. When you're talking about that, that. How many people think it's actually going to be the superstar that 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 does everything that's going to make things happen, right? Yeah, and and that's why I think that was so wild that in that study they found out that the the way that productivity came was because they basically pecked out the other ones that they thought was slowing them down because they themselves were you know the super chicken. And it's like you look at that verse like you read in John 15, it's, you know Jesus said, "In me you will bear much fruit." And it's like already the only super chicken is Jesus, and it's that recognition of just like you not that he's a chicken, it. right? <laughs> Where it's like Jesus, Lord, he doesn't have a wash me, Jesus. It's, that was Steve. But it's, okay. it's 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 that awareness of that you can't have any production if you're trying to do something in your own strength. If you're trying to realize that you're going to do it on your own, you're already it's it's only a matter of time before you burn out. And it's like when you come to the recognition that what is success what is production but it's like you got to have people around you you got to have that awareness of like i can't do it on my own but you said god's designed it that way that each of us have a part and yep. you know some people think it's just so much easier for me just to do it but the truth is you're not supposed to do it all mm -hmm. you know and in in god we're supposed to listen um, if any in the movie uh, the the drama years ago that i don't vouch for but the title of it you know jesus christ superstar And that he's the superstar of his church, you know, he's the one that is uh, that he's the star. You know, Tommy Tenney says God has this this interesting idea that church is about him. <laughs> you know, and it is. It's totally about him. And and when you think about what's what he's doing, that he said he calls us to be fruitful. He says I want you to be fruitful. I want you to bear much fruit. I want you to bear fruit that lasts. I want to bear I want to bear fruit that lasts. And um, and it's so important to think about this because Jesus says we're not known by we're not known by what we what we uh, what we do we're known by our fruit yeah I mean you think about it and the word known when you think about known you know it's a lot of people a lot of superstars that people are paying to do something they're known mm. but the question is are you known mm -hmm. are you known because Matthew chapter 7 says something very specifically. It says, I never what? Jesus says, I never knew you. But they did a lot of things, right? They did things that we would call very, very churchy, very religious, you know, very, seems right. You know, he's laying hands on the sick. People are getting well. He's casting out demons. He's prophesying. He's, speak, he's speaking in tongues and uh, whatever it is. And, uh, but, He's saying, like, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoer. Mm -hmm. So this program is really about not all the clicking noise that I'm hearing right now, but this program is about specifically about 
you. We wanted to tell you now because Jesus is going to Jesus. This, Jesus is an awesome Lord and Savior, but He's also a judge, and that uh, He's a righteous judge. Behold, of the goodness and kindness of God, and that we have to produce fruit. Jesus says the only way you're going to know someone is by their fruit. And this super chicken analogy is the fact that, okay, they got five eggs, they got four eggs, you know, what does Jesus call fruit? You know, mm-hmm. what, what does that, that come out as? And so it's important for us to realize, and you can, you can partner with someone, you got all of our partners, thank you for those that partner with us, but, and that are praying for us even right now as we're on the air broadcasting around the world, that it's us together doing this, so we're all producing fruit together. But are you a part of of what God is doing, you know, in producing as this whole analogy here that, that um, William um, Muir, is it William Muir, had did the particular study about super chickens? That's a big question, isn't it? And so mm-hmm. I, think, I think about this, that, you know, so some uh, people are successful, some groups are successful, and some groups are not. And what they did was they did a study at MIT to be able to, to test this whole theory. And they had about 100 people or so, and they broke them up into small groups. But we want to hear, as Margaret talks about specifically what happened at MIT, and see how that applies to us as the church. Because a lot of times, we're just one big, massive people. We, we, come, we all love Jesus. I'm not saying anything about that. We all love the Lord. We come in this huge herd of cattle are coming in, and we get all this music and this worship. We're, having this, we're, we're, we're still strangers. We still don't know each other. And then all of a sudden we leave and we're like a big crowd and we leave and we leave strangers and we, you know, pass each other in a parking lot, maybe somewhere. And it's like, wait a minute, we're just like these corporations. The church has turned in to a corporation. Let's see what she said about the study with MIT. So what, what is it that makes some groups obviously more successful and more productive than others? Well, that's the question a team at MIT took to research. They brought in hundreds of volunteers, they put them into groups, and they gave them very hard problems to solve. And what happened was exactly what you'd expect, that some groups were very much more successful than others. But what was really interesting was that the high-achieving groups were not those where they had one or two people with spectacularly high IQ, nor were the most successful groups the ones that had the highest aggregate IQ. Instead, they had three characteristics, the really successful teams. First of all, they showed high degrees of social sensitivity to each other. This is measured by something called the reading the mind in the eye test. It's broadly considered a test for empathy, and the groups that scored highly on this did better. Secondly, the successful groups gave roughly equal time to each other so that no one voice dominated, but neither were there any passengers. And thirdly, the more successful groups had more women in them. Well, that just goes to show you that you need to involve more women in your church to be able to be more successful, right? This is a, <laughs> this is a women TED Talk that's happening there. She's talking to the, to the ladies there. And what it is, is God's designed each of us to bring something to the table Mm-hmm. And with this MIT study, they found out, of course, you know, some succeeded, some didn't succeed. They looked in the facts, like, obviously, there must be some highly intelligent person at the tables that succeeded. Uh, they're, they're basically saying, no, there was no intelligent people here. <laughs> <on> the <table>. <laughs> <laughs> they said, well, let's just add up all their IQs together. That must be it. And then they add up all their IQs, like, nope, none of them is that smart, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, but what they found out was, that the highly successful groups had three things in common. This is something we can really understand about how we as believers can apply these same principles. These are, these are, mm-hmm. these are common principles cre- our creator cre- created. How they're called, It's about social ability and love. He says the highly successful groups had, she said, the highly successful groups had three common characteristics, uh, high degrees of social sensitivity towards each other. They're not sociopaths. <laughs> they actually, you know, sociopaths have no ability to have empathy. Zero. Focusing on what somebody else has to say, relationship. Right, right. But if you don't have the ability to, I mean, how many organizations are ran like sociopaths? I'm like, there's no empathy at this company. There's no empathy in this organization. Maybe there's no empathy in, you know, church. Anyway, so 
a high degree of social sensitivity towards each other. In other words, they're connecting, or they don't give you time to connect. Yeah. You know, the, the way it's designed is about, you know, crowd in, crowd out, crowd in, crowd out, crowd in. And the second thing was, was it gave rough, they got in these successful groups that were empath, had empathy in the groups, but also as they, they gave each person equal time to be able to share, you know, there was no free ride. Nobody could just sit back mm -hmm. and, and just ride off the others. They had to participate, but they gave people, you know, a time to be able to talk and, and to share. That's a very powerful thing. How many, how many, let me ask you right now, if you, if you are a Christian and you go to church, good, but I want to ask you, has anybody asked you to share? Has anybody ever talked to you about, you know, what, what's God saying to you? Or, mm -hmm. or you hear this teaching for, um, you know, an hour, and, but, and somebody says, I need to hear what the Lord is saying to you about that teaching. Has that ever happened? Well, they're saying successful, to be successful here, yeah, everybody needs to bring something to the table. And we'll talk about scripture that fits to that. The third thing was that they had women in the group. And so when you think about those three qualities is that successful groups have social connectivity, not social network, like this technology stuff, but you're, you literally have social connectivity that you, this is going to be shocker. I mean, you might not believe this, Steve, but you can actually enjoy going to church. I mm -hmm. know <laughs> so it's like crazy, right? Oh my gosh. Can you imagine? Oh, and, well, here, and, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, ahead. hearing her talk, I mean, I hear relationship and humility. I mean, for someone to actually take the time to be like, like you're saying, I want to know what it is that you hear. And versus just saying somebody talking for 45 minutes and then everybody leaves. It's just like everybody could have completely missed what was just said versus just like having that relationship. Instead, what you had said before, we're all going to one location, all as individuals sitting down an hour or however long later, we're all getting up and leaving. And it's like, imagine if we had that relationship beforehand, the other six days of the week to actually care about where that person is. And then during that time of God speaking, it's like you realize having a conversation and Holy Spirit moves in all that. And it's just like the revelation continues because it's one person- the book of Acts. Exactly. One person hears and, and Holy Spirit drops a nugget in their heart as to, you know, what was talked about a scripture. And one person hears that. And then all of a sudden it's, it's like, a, it's like a, it's like a symphony. It's just like an ebb and flow. Somebody shares something and then Holy Spirit has this revelation. And it's like, you're almost edifying and encouraging one another. But you and know, this is what Margaret's saying in the study is, is this particular point, corporations, it never crossed their mind. Mm -hmm that mm -hmm. you know um, bob or susan the receptionist had anything to contribute significantly yep. to this yep. this uh corporate model that's going on yeah but it's you know it's and not only that 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 it's not that you know it's good to include everybody it's like if jesus died for them you're important if i won't say if jesus died for them they're worth listening to yeah how can you, if he died, if God gave his son to die for them, and you don't think they have anything to contribute, and obviously they may be immature, they may need to be trained up in their character, but if you don't think they have anything to contribute, what, what supersized thing, is, spirit is inside of you that's not in the other person? It's the same Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. and, and so yeah, I think about this, I think about what Jesus commanded us. I don't even know if I have that right yet. Jesus commanded in uh, what's it, uh, John chapter thirteen? Let me see if we have this here. We can see it, but in the scriptures, he's commanding specifically what for for us. He said, "I give you a new commandment." This is like this is it. I want you to do this, right? So he says, "A new commandment I give to you: love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another." Another, and then he says, "By this, by this." sensitivity towards each other like they're talking about in this study he said by by this everyone will actually know that you're my disciple if you love one another so what she's talking about in this study is about what jesus told us he says you'll function best when you actually care about people you have empathy for people and bring everybody to the table and what happens quite often when you start first start bringing bringing people to the table is 
they're shocked they'd never been brought to the table before. They're used to sitting at the kitty table, you know, going like, just feed me. I got my little fork and my knife and that type of thing. And just, you know, fork it out to me and I will stay a child forever, you know. And, uh, and so it's a biblical principle that she's talking about. You know, when she's talking about, you know, that that having empathy and connectedness, this is the most successful groups uh, uh, had the social connectivity. And I think about this. This is going to really surprise you. I know I, I said this earlier, but you could actually enjoy hanging out with God's people. <laughs> you know, it's something you look forward to. It's something that you protect. It's some, It's First of all, Jesus said, whatever you've done to the least of these of mine, you've done it to me. Right? So... If you're not doing something to the church, to another believer, you're not doing it to Jesus. So a good thing or a bad thing. And then he says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6, I believe, he says, he says I, I'm not unjust. I will not forget the love you have shown me and that you continue to show me as you help my people and you continue to help them. If you're kept away from the table of participating and being the church, and I'm not talking about just Sunday at 10 or whatever, then you're missing out on loving Jesus. You know, people say, oh, I love the Lord. Jesus says, you know, it all, it all depends on how you relate to your brother and your sister. If you treat people bad, you treat Jesus bad. Mm-hmm. But that paradigm is learned like it was at MIT and these studies was, oh, I didn't realize we need to bring everybody to the table. <laughs> it just never crossed their mind. You know, they would just headhunt. I remember Donna worked at uh, Balboa Life and Casualty, my wife, and they had headhunters calling. They call them headhunters, which are basically looking for you know, super chickens. And their job was to hunt all these corporations and find who is the best player on the team, like sports. And uh, and they would try to pay that person and hire that person. And then they would basically be a broker to, to transport super chickens from one place to the other, thinking their company was going to be better. But what they're finding out through this understanding is God's created us for social connectivity. And uh, I know that when we come to I know when we come to church, we come to gather up. It's it's a very it's most part most exciting time. <laughs> you know, I don't know about for everybody else. It's for everybody. I, I get excited when I come because first of all, there's some great cooks, you know. And I know when Jesus was uh, coming to meet with the church, that he would uh, eat with them. Do you know that? And he would drink with them. Isn't that something? So, so what do you think about when uh, <laughs> you come together at church? Is this something exciting for you? Is this something you're like, oh, no, oh, my goodness, i got to get my tie out and, you no, know. Absolutely. To me, that's family. To me, that's I, I have never had um, a group of people where I feel more valued because at that time, it's like, you know, what we're talking about. People actually care about you. They care about what you have to say. They care about what you're going through, that there's, there's, there's relationship. And yes, the food is phenomenal. And, but it's also not just the natural food. It's the spiritual food, being able to be there. That's why one of, one of the things too, is just like, I remember being with the church and it was just that moment, you know, Jesus says when he's talking about, um, that moment with the, the woman at the well, um, the Samaritan woman. And the disciples walk up and Jesus says, I have meat that you know not of. My meat is to do the Father's will. And it's just like that moment of like, Jesus says, my flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. And it's interesting that when two or more are gathered and they're talking about Jesus, they're talking about the testimony, they're talking about a miracle of what God did in their life. They're talking about scripture or what God spoke to them during the week. It's suddenly, it's just like, he's there. His presence is there, his real bread. And it's like you're feeding on his presence. And it's just like the meat of his presence. And it's just like, once you have that, once you taste that, that's why, you know, I think it's the book of Psalms that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And when you have that fellowship with people who are hungry for Jesus, that want to spend time with people who are hungry for Jesus, it's just like, why would you want to be anywhere else? We think about it. Jesus said, where two, where two or more are gathered together in, in my name, not mm. their name, but in my name, mm. he shows up. Amen. I mean, who wants to go to a quote church meeting where God doesn't show up? Yeah. I mean, that's like a that's just a very sad event. And and 
what God wants, you know, of all the things that God chose to do was to save us through his own family. He wanted sons, so he sowed a son. He gave his son for us to pay the price for us so we could be sons and daughters of God, which is the which is the 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 word you don't hear much about called family. It's interesting that everything that you can imagine is trying to attack the whole concept of family. Mm-hmm. But it could it be that the church has left it. I know that uh, Ken Summerall, a uh, spiritual father to me and the Lord this past is with God now, that uh, he said, you know, you institutionalize your kids when they're young, and now they're going to institutionalize you when you're old. But in, in between that is a religious institution where all of a sudden we just institutionalize God in how we do things. And you're born into things. Sometimes you're just born and you think it always was that way. But what you do is you go into Scripture and find out, say, wait a minute, it's not that way. I remember reading Scripture going, you know, early in this walk and saying, wait a minute, I don't see how that fits in what we're doing. I don't, I don't understand it. But if there's no fear of God, I want to say this outright, you need fences. You need, you know, you need, if there's no parents, you need orphanages. You need somebody that's going to take care of God's people. And people are doing hard as they, they're working as hard as they can to do that. But in Malachi, he says, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, he would send the spirit of Elijah and he would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the parents to the children, and the children to the fathers. That's a family paradigm. That's a family paradigm. He says, or else I'll smite the earth with a curse. So the earth begins to shake when we refuse to be able to respond to what God's expectation is of his church, which is family. And so you know, they, call, they talk about it as, as social connectiveness in this study. But what we're saying, that's just like a family connectedness. As a matter of fact, we get, I want to listen to her again. She's talking here about social connectivity being the key. But you know, Steve, I want you to share after she shares this about you know, how foreign the concept of, of peaceful family mm-hmm. was you know, when you first started seeing the church as family. So Mar- Margaret's talking here about what the key to their success was, was social connectivity. No, but the striking thing about this experiment is that it showed what we know, which is some groups do better than others. But what's key to that is their social connectedness to each other. So how does this play out in the real world? Well, it means that what happens between people really counts. Because in groups that are highly attuned and sensitive to each other, ideas can flow and grow, people don't get stuck, they don't waste energy down dead ends. So you look at it that, and so what they discovered was that, that it just works when there's social connectivity. You, you know, ideas do not come from organizations. Ideas come from people. People decide they're going to have one. Of all the things that Jesus died for, the, the one thing that Jesus died for is for people. It's not for your building. It's not for your organization. It's not for how you dress. It's for human beings. And, uh, but when we're together like that, you know, it's sort of like talking out loud. There's sometimes, you know, I think it was... Uh, Jordan Peterson that said the reason why people go to therapy is so they can talk. And when, when you, when you start talking, you start thinking. And so those two things together help you begin to work things out. Well, if we talk to each other in God's presence, God ideas begin to form, you know, good, good ideas, God ideas, God just drops the wisdom in. And so often we're trying to find out what God's wanting to do ourselves. And we're not talking to, to others about, you know, um, what God's saying, what God's saying to you. And it, to me, it's the most encouraging thing just to, even if I, if I preach, you know, for uh, 45 minutes or an hour or something like that, I want to hear what people have to say. What's God saying to you based on that? If you haven't ever done that as a pastor, it's like a, it's like a, a final quiz from every test to find out. I was like, my goodness, did they get the message that's going on? You'll find out they, God takes it to whole new levels. And so, Meaningful relationships is what's discovered in this particular study, which just means loving one another and bearing each other's burdens. That's what we're called to do, the, the, the one another's that take place, but it happens in the context of relationship. It's family. Obviously, they're talking about organizational structures and people inside the organization, but they're saying, start acting like family there, like, like you care about each other, and we're going to be more successful as an industry. Maybe when you hear family, it just kind of like throws you off. You want to redefine it because it's so painful to you. Maybe, you know, that 
maybe you've been educated in the present day education system in the world and they they totally belittle family and they just think that it should be over with that marriage is bad and family is bad and all that type of stuff but god family is a god design but it's god's form of family it's not just any family but when god is over it and the people are in god in it, it it's a beautiful thing and the church is family steve talk to us about how you know that the first time you when God, obviously, you got an awesome testimony. We'll, we'll share that. We'll make it a link on this where you can, you can hear his testimony about how he, he, he met God, or God, God met him, and uh, at, at a place called Miller L House. But we can't go there. Now. So, but you came to God, and you were watching, you were watching the church. You were watching mm-hmm. the church. And uh, what was going on? What was going on? Uh, people were gathering. We were sitting around a kitchen table. Everyone had brought food. Everybody was just talking about the Lord, what what I was doing. And I was just sitting, watching, waiting for the argument to break out. Why? Waiting for, a, waiting for a plate to be thrown, waiting for somebody to stomp out the door, something. And I remember just being shocked and thinking to myself, how can so many people come together and talk for so long and nobody argue, nobody burst out in some fit of rage and leave. And I, and I was just like, I was absolutely speechless and I was watching this and I'm just like, what is this? Because like, just like you said, growing up, my grid for family was just the dysfunctional family show, but right, At which is most time, families, like, most families, right, outside of you God, just, are dysfunctional. Yeah, and that's the thing is you don't know how to do family God's way, especially if one, if you've never been taught it, if you've never seen it, if you've never had it modeled in front of you, and it, it gives you empathy for people who have never known. It's like, well, if God says do it this way, but they themselves have never seen it, yeah. how unfair is it to expect something of someone that they themselves have never been taught? Yeah. So when God called me, when God just found me and literally radically saved my life, I, amazing. Mm. Being around family, it was like I had no idea. Like it was foreign. Oh, absolutely. It was, but, but yeah, it was. It was like wow. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And and but the thing is, though, I couldn't even put words on it because I had never seen it before. And the only thing I could I, I, that I could. Um, that I could even kind of consider was, was just like, you know, uh, the TV shows from, I, I, I can't think of what the TV shows, but like where a family actually gets along and laughs and, and they're, actually, they're paid on the TV show. Yeah. yeah it's just like, <laughs> yeah. They're, they're not really a family, right. but coming together. I, I remember the, the, the day that you actually sat down and talked to me and you said, <laughs> you can't just keep watching this. Cause you're you like watching to, the church. Oh, you know? I, you know, oh yeah. I was just like watching a TV show because yeah, it was, right. I'd literally never right. seen it before. So I was just like, and I realized that I had no idea how to have a healthy conversation. Right. And it was, it, it's almost like in that moment that you don't even realize you're dysfunctional mm-hmm. until you physically, visibly see functioning, healthy family. Right. And you, you just think you're normal. Yeah. And, and, and for 28 years, mm-hmm. I was normal. Right. And, and, it, and it's only when you come around the church, when you come around healthy family, when you come around people who love you for who you are, mm-hmm. you come to find out. And it's just like, I don't know how to have healthy family. Right. And it's amazing because it's only through that do you begin to grow. And it's just like, it, you don't just all of a sudden just uh, walk into healthy family. You got to grow in it like anything. Yeah. And, and so you're looking at that, you know, everybody contributes to a healthy family. And, um, and today society is families all mixed up, you know. Mm-hmm. Quite often, you know, parents raise their children in a way that the children don't have to do anything. They don't contribute anything to the family, which causes them to feel like unwanted. They're not important. They have nothing to offer. And so then they go to the workplace. Then they go to the workplace and they're communicating. They're the same person. So they're in the workplace thinking like, I can get along here because this is about super chickens and that, you know, I just got to produce. If I just produce, mm-hmm. everything will be fine here. I could be dying inside. You know, I could be, and maybe that's you right now. You're watching, you're dying inside. You know, the, the boss likes what you're doing. She likes what you're doing. He likes what you're doing. 
but nobody's asking about you. Nobody, nobody's even understanding that you're at the end of yourself. You know, you're doing the work. You're the super chicken, maybe. But, and you know you get approval when you do that, but you feel miserable. It's because you're called to be in the context of family, and you best function how God's designed you to be a contributing factor to a larger group, or a group at least, you know, some other individuals. And so she talks about it. So the church, and you can see where we pretty much have said, you know, forget about family and the church and just turn it into an organization. And you can go, I mean, you got specialties, you know, you got like children's specialties, men's specialties, women's specialties, you know, it's like everybody's got these, you know, specialties. And now the doctors are specialties. And first, you used to have one family doctor, but now you have a, you know, a specific doctor for a specific body part. Like we're not whole human beings. And God's designed us to be able to wholly function in there. And we're finding out by super chicken study how this thing functions. It's telling on us how things are. So the question she answers here, and Margaret answers, is how, how does this translate? You know, we got the study. We figured it out. How does this translate now in the business sector? And let's just look at this. It's going to make a lot of sense. Check it out. It. They figured out that when the going gets tough, and it always will get tough if you're doing breakthrough work that really matters, what people need is social support, and they need to know who to ask for help. Companies don't have ideas. Only people do. And what motivates people are the bonds and loyalty and trust they develop between each other. What matters is the mortar not just the bricks oh my goodness that is so powerful the mortar i'm thinking about the mortar the mortar is what that stuff that you put in between bricks i mean that totally nailed it the social support the what helps people become more fruitful is is the the social support that's actually there and it makes me think about you know jesus talks about that look at this over here he said he talks about this in colossians he said, uh, when he's talking about, you know, what holds things together, let me see, here we go. All righty, there we go. Look at this. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly love, clothe yourself with compassion. These are, these are words that cause community to happen. Without these words, there's no community. He says, therefore, clothe yourself with um, dear, we're on close yourself with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience, patience. So he's talking about, these are things that happen with other people. So you're, you're being patient, you're being kind with them. But then he also says, you know, uh, bear each, bear with each other and bear with each other and forgive one another. And if any of you have any grievance with somebody, you know, go ahead and just forgive them. Just like let them go. Because you cannot have a family if you don't have forgiveness going on. Then he goes a little bit further. He says right here, this is what I want to talk about is the the they're talking about the the mortar here. Let's go back there to the to the there we go. He said, uh he says in verse 14, he says, and over all these virtues, put on love, which is the mortar, by the way, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So you're looking at you're looking at what actually holds us together, the mortar that holds family and relationships together. It's just shocker, is love. It's love. Think about that. So it's the mortar that they found, Steve, is it's it's called social. They called it social support. And how many organizations and people are saying we just need more uh, governmental social workers to go out and do something than other people who understand biblical expectations and God's expectations and say the church needs to do that. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. the church says, I don't get that myself from the church. So how, how, <laughs> how is that going to work? Right. I feel like a stranger. I show up. I'm so excited about God. And I, I sit there in my little spot, the same spot. And I say, Hey, to a couple different people, but then, you know, I leave and I'm just as lonely as I was when I first got there. Yeah. How can and, you show up with all these people and still be lonely? And still be lonely. That's what uh, that's what uh, Bishop T.D. Jake says. It's just like, dear Lord, if I have to be lonely, please let me be alone. That's right. But how many people find themselves in a crowd and just like what you said before, have no relationship. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you know, leaning over to the person next to you because they said, you know, okay, let's give each other, you know, the welcome or whatever. But it's just like, it's hard to have value when you don't have relationship because you don't understand 
love. You don't understand. That's like what you were saying earlier that, you know, it's interesting that Jesus says, many people are going to come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did I not? But I never knew you, knew you. Never knew but you. simply yeah. taking the time to know the people next to you, mm -hmm. when you know the person who works alongside of you, when you know the person who you see every day, and it's just like, do you know their name? Yeah. Yes, I know they, you, that person brought you the email. Yes, I know that person greeted you or they have a, you know, a name tag on their mm -hmm. chest, but it's just like, what is their name? Yeah. yeah. God yeah. died for them. God died for you. He, mm -hmm. he cares about you. Mm -hmm. He knows your name. He knows the hairs and the numbers of hairs on your head. Right. And it's just like, how much more do you feel compelled to, to want to, to, to bring that extra effort in that moment when you realize like I'm valued, the person right. next to me has value. Right. And it's so important when you think about it that that if you don't talk to them, if you don't spend time mm -hmm. with them, why are you surprised they don't feel valued? It's so yeah. it's so interesting when some tragedy takes place and somebody ends their life and people are going like, I didn't see it. I didn't know what was going on, wasn't mm -hmm. happening. That's the environment of, you know, not not connecting. Yeah. Now it could be the individual that refused to connect. They never grew up in it, they never knew about the things of God and how that that how to connect. There's so many different expressions of the church coming together that that goes without any of the mortar of you can do it for a long time. I had one particular uh, minister of a supersized uh, church that said uh, braggingly that this lady was at my church for six months and she didn't even know it was the church. And I'm going like, and this was a good thing to him. Like, this is a good thing. Right? How can you be anywhere for six months and not know where and you are? Yeah. Right. And it's like, you're, that's not that. How can G, Jesus is not there? I don't know. We'll just move on from that. But you're looking at, you know, mortar. They found out that mortar is that social connectiveness, the social support, the meaningful relationships, the lot, the reliable relationships, the inclusive relationships. It's just like, you know, when Paul was writing to the church of, of, of Colossians and he said, over all these virtues, put on love, which is the mortar. It holds all things together in perfect unity. Yeah. And so it's just, it's actually a relationship. I mean, Jesus is not saying swipe right if you want to go to church and swipe left if you don't. That's not, that's all technology. That mm -hmm. has nothing to do with intimacy and being with someone. And it doesn't satisfy how many people you know, it's like, I got a thousand friends. Like, how can anybody, God can do that, but we can't, we can't do that. Yeah. And so, so many people have a relationship with the five guys in Silicon Valley, girls, guys and girls that are running those companies. And we did a program on that. We'll make it a related below that you can see it. And they, they're thinking they have some sort of relationship, but all of a sudden these consequences happen in their life. Like they didn't know anybody. They felt so unknown. This is the most medicated emotional medication society I think that we've ever had because people are suffering about from so much depression. And uh, Rick Joyner of Morningstar Ministries recently said that if you're in depression, it's because you, you, you've distanced yourself away from God because the closer you get to God's presence, you're not, you're not depressed. You know, you're not, you're not, you're not depressed. It's just so powerful. I think about, you know, family then. We're understanding what they found out in the study is that the family is an important thing to be able to have. So, so you're not just showing up for church. You're showing up for your elder brother and Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your father, God, and your brother and sister in the Lord. And maybe a spiritual father, a spiritual mother's there, but you're coming to hang out, right? Well, I, exactly that. And it's like what we were talking about before. It's just like when you have people that are coming together and you're encouraging one another, you have those days when you when you have someone that really lifts you up. Right. And the next time you come together, you may be, you know, having to lift them up because yeah. you understand that it's just like that's where that social connectiveness comes together because you realize it's just like we, you know, um I had that, the, the scripture's leaving me. It was like uh, it says like, uh, uh, you know, a friend that that's closer than a brother. Yeah. And it's just like, we need people in our lives that are with us walking arm in arm. It's just like, we're not called to do this alone. We can't do this alone. And that is what is so beautiful about what she's talking about is the fact of that those, th those greatest productivities is the team. And it's just like, we're able to bear fruit when we're walking with Jesus, walking with others, because it's just yeah. like, that's where the fruit happens. And that's where 
That's where fruit happens. I'm like that. Yeah. Hashtag where, fruit happens. Yeah. Yeah, because he says apart from a body hanging out with him and being in a relationship with him, you can do nothing. You can't bear fruit. Yet we're called to do something. Think about this. Mm -hmm. Think about this. Hey, Pat, I know you're producing the program, but think about this. You think about this. We're called to mm -hmm. do something that we cannot do outside of doing it with Jesus Christ. I mean, you think about that. That's yeah. amazing. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I mean, you just can't. There's no way. Um, believe me, I've tried. <laughs> it's difficult. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so easy to get in the flesh and get in your head about, you know, certain things. And, you know, when frustrations of life hits you and um, then, then at some point you just fall on your knees and say, God, help me. I need you. It happens at that point, right? It's like, what happened? It just happened. How did it happen when I yeah. fell on my knees? Exactly. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had to do that, you know, because you get so stuck in your head. You forgot. You forget. It's like, Lord, okay, I'm sorry. Forgive me of my pride. Help me out here. Right. I need your help. So, so how important? How important is it for the church being family? And how is that? How does that keep us healthy? And that we go through these ups and downs, and you know, to come together and be able to to always be there with God's family. How does that feel? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, it's 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 priceless. You can't put a price on it. It's so beautiful being around family and people that truly love you that care about you care about your family care about what's going on in your life it's not just you know patting you on the back give me that one hug hey good to see you brother yeah right. i'm out you right. know it's genuine you know and you cannot um like i said you can't put a price on that mm -hmm. what would you say to that yeah. person that is out there and they don't know that's available they're just thinking i've been to the building i've been to the thing mm. i've been to the you know 400 see meal going on and i was just as mm -hmm. stranger as anything else as i was at home because now i sat with 400 people and as like td jake says now I'm, I'm it's worse because now i was with a whole bunch of people who i thought was the answer and i was right. still just as lonely what would you say to that person you know i would seek out relationship you know find another man if you're a woman find another woman you know get in a close relationship get accountable with somebody you know somebody's going to challenge you you know, in these areas of your life that you may be struggling with, you know, somebody you can just pour your heart out, heart out to that you trust. That's important. And, oh yeah. yeah trust, trust is, yeah. yeah, that's totally. And, um, yeah, just meet on a regular basis, you know, whether it's outside the building, you get, you know, go to coffee shop, go to each other's house. Oh, you're talking about being a Christian. It's a Christian person. Yeah. Okay. a believer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, not as anybody, believe yes, me. Right, right. Hey, we, <laughs> yeah, big difference. Right, big difference. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's important. Stay in a relationship. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's, that's so good. Nothing I mean, like it. You, you know, think, you think about, you know, we have a few jokes we talked about, and we built Promise Keepers groups that, you know, sharing too much, too soon, too fast, where you kind of go around the room, and all of a sudden you just come together, you think, this, this script is perfect. I'm going to share my heart, I got these group of guys or the group of ladies, you know, just a few of us, we're gonna share our heart. And the first, you know, guy says, and they're gonna go around the circle. The first guy says, you know, I, um, I've had a few issues in my life, you know, when I was at work, I run the cash register and I feel so bad about it, but I took $10 out of the cash register. I'm just, I feel terrible about it. And the brothers go, oh, mm -hmm. we're about it, we're about it. And this guy goes, yeah, yeah, I, man, I've gone through uh, some serious issues. You know, I was really struggling with my eyes and things I was seeing on the internet, and I shouldn't have been seeing that. It was just so bad, and I didn't know what to do. And like, oh, the guys go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the next guy says, man, I, you're, I took, a, I, I didn't have done that in years, but I just had to tell you what I did. I was young. I took a car for a joyride. I, I know it's wrong. It's bad. And then finally, this other guy shares. He goes. Well, my problem is I'm a gossiper. Everything I know, I tell everyone, right? <laughs> and so many people are burned that way because they just go find anybody and somebody says, mm -hmm. you know, we're friends. And I think about, you know, I don't have his book with me, but um, Dr. Epps's book, and we'll be talking more about it, but, you know, these five different stages of a relationship that it takes time to build a healthy family. And we'll talk more about on our next program because we're going to continue the super chicken talk uh, on our next program, but... The first thing you got to do is, is, is in building a, a healthy relationship is somebody has to know you first, you know? And so the, the first thing you're like, Hey, how are you doing? This is who I am. This is what's going on or whatever. And the second step after in, a, in building a healthy 
relationship with empathy in it uh, is um, to trust someone. That's a big deal. I mean, so many people say, you know, you can trust me. All they're wanting is you to do to share the information that they share someone else, right? And mm -hmm. so once you share something about yourself, then now you can see if you can trust them. You can't trust them until they know something about you. So once somebody knows something about you, then they're trustworthy with that. The next thing that you can do is like, this is truly a good relationship. I can commit to this. You know, it's just, it's just or, or rely. You can rely on that person. They're a reliable person. And so, so many people just rely on people, but they don't know them. They don't trust them. They don't have any reason, you know, to, there was nothing in their relationship that came up with that. I and mean, a lot of people do things that produce an untrustworthy, untrustworthy action that can't be brought in, but just, it's how to measure a good, healthy family relationship, a good church relationship. And so the next thing is after you can rely on, that feels real good when you can rely on somebody. They say, I'm going to be here at five. I, had, I have had people that just, you say they're going to do things, they just don't do it. And they, and they do it in the name of God. You know, and you know, I'm not going to say they're different positions, but it's every position. And so, and if anything, that if you are a minister in the gospel, people need to rely on you. If you're a Christian and you're not reliable, just being reliable is a great witness, you know, but just being reliable. The once they're reliable after a time, then you can commit to this person. You can commit to this, this church and what's going on and, and this relationship like Pat's talking about. And finally, the last aspect of that is, is intimacy or empathy, where now you're really connecting. And that's the love that's holding us all together that Colossians talks about. Listen, being in the church is not as as hard as religion has made it out to be and it's not as frivolous as the as some others have made it out to be but it's the most awesome thing that you could ever do is accept jesus christ as your lord and savior i know a lot of you may have done that already and you're just isolated you might be listening to us you know all over the world you know we know that our audience is around the world you matter to us we're seeing your comments right now as you're even uh talking to us as we speak we're seeing all your comments on our on our different channels our social media broadcasts but understand this, we came on today to tell you that you matter. You matter. You matter so much that, that God gave his son and Jesus, Jesus, his son, willingly laid his life down so that you could be in relationship with God, so that you could be in the family of God. It's all about family. Jesus came and lived a sinless life, born of a virgin as the son of God, and was offered up on the cross willingly to take the sins of the world on, to pay the price for me and you to be able to have, be in relationship with God. How can we not take God up on the offer? My goodness. The enemies just beat family up in such a way, maybe in your mind, and your heart, you're thinking like, I don't want anything to do with family. But if you say that, you don't want anything to do with God because God is a family. He's a father. He calls himself father. He didn't call himself, he called himself, so, he calls himself, when you talk to me, he says, call, first thing you say is our father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's a, our Father. But you have a chance right now to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord. Accept the price that he paid. All of us have all these issues that we come to God with, like, God, I'm just a mess. You know, I've had some issues before I got saved. I had some issues after I got saved. Jesus didn't come to make, you know, bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And we become alive in Jesus Christ. We get saved out of our, our sins. And listen, I want to encourage you. We're committed to walk with you. We're committed to walk with you as we begin to walk out. What does it mean to be family? You know, what does it mean to be the church? Difficult days are coming. But I want, the safest place that you can be in the enduring place that you can be is rightly related in the body of Christ as a son and daughter of God. If that's you right now, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray with me right now. I want you to pray with me. Just pray out loud. I mean this. This is why we're doing this. We're doing this for you. We wanted you to know God loves you and God's got a plan for your life. And all you have to do is invite him into your life right now. Invite him into your heart and he will come up. He will show up. He will show up. Pray with me right now. Jesus, that's why you're talking to Jesus. Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. That you came and lived a sinless life, perfect life that you died for my sins and you were raised again on the third day by the Father. Jesus, 
forgive me. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against others. I've sinned against myself. Forgive me, Jesus. Wash me, Jesus. Make me new, Jesus. Jesus, I want to be in your family. If you prayed that prayer with me, guess what? You're in the family of God. He calls it the adoption. He, I was adopted now into the family of God. You're adopted to the family of God. That's so exciting. We have some information for you. You know, you can see it on your screen here. Hey, contact us. You know, let us know about this awesome decision. You go to meetmyfather.org, meetmyfather.org, and find out a couple of our stories, but also find out what to do and how to connect to a body of believers. And you know, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. You can connect now with all the things that we have going on. But I want to say this. Welcome to the family of God. It's, it's something you have to learn. It's something we have to walk out together. But guess what? Our Father is committed to his family, and we're committed to you. This is what he tells us. He says he's not unjust. He will not forget the love we have shown him as we help you. That's how we love God is, help, is loving you and helping you. I'm very excited about your future. Listen, next program, we're going to be talking more about super chickens, about the studies going on about social capital. Do you know, once, once this particular company figured this out, check this out. Once they, once they figured this out and one, one person that did this study shared it with a company, the company, when they put the principles that we're talking about into play in their company, they made $15 million more in profits that year. They were... 15 million more eggs, and they're more productive. 10% higher in the cost the uh, the employee um, pleasure. They liked working for the company. You know what I'm saying? It's like they made 15. They just put these. Imagine if the church puts these principles into practice. Guess what's going to happen? It's going to. That's exactly what's going to happen in our next gathering. But also, I have. Listen, if you're not abiding with God, if you're not abiding with Him, and Pat, if you can get that ready for us, if you're not abiding with Jesus. And most people want to do it. He says we can't do any of this without abiding with him. We got to have a simple, we got to be able to, to, and a lot of people want to do it. They just need a simple plan to be able to do it. Guess what? We have a simple plan for you, a free, simple plan at iabide.org. Check this out. You know, a lot of people want to abide with the Lord, but they just don't have a plan to do it. You can request that plan today at iabide.org. Go to iabide.org and request your simple abiding plan. People have requested this plan from every, almost every nation in the world. In the world! Oh my goodness. We have so many great things we're going to be making available, available for you. Don't forget, you can go to greglancaster.org. Everything's there for you. Everything you can imagine. We've been talking about this for years to be able to encourage you, sourced information in a way that you can connect, greglancaster.org. And be sure to catch us next Tuesday live at 7 p.m. Central Time, 8 p.m. Eastern, all those wonderful times. You can see that on your screen. God bless, and thanks for joining us on The Greg Lancaster Show.